Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And if you are not new here among us, you know Tony gave a great message last week. So I want to thank him for that. Uh, but if you are new, maybe you have a question. Maybe if you're not new, you've pondered this question. And the question is this. Can I be a Christian without going to church? Can I be a Christian without a church? Short answer, yes. Yes, you can. But it is something like being a student who won't go to school, a soldier who won't join the army, a salesman with no customers, an author without readers, I know what that's like. <laughs> a tuba player without a band or an orchestra, because who wants to hear a tuba solo? There's got to be, well, you're all tuba players now because you're not laughing. <laughs> Yet still, there are those who say, they insist, I can be a Christian without the church. So a good friend of mine shared uh, this article, Babylon Bee, I like satire, Everything's funny to me. So I want to share this with you. This came up. <laughs> I don't need church, right? I study the Bible for myself. Said someone who never read the Bible. Indeed, as we're learning here, the context for the majority of the New Testament is church. <laughs> it's about church, right? So these letters we're reading, they're written to the churches, right? Or people who are in charge of the churches. We looked at Jude. What happened? He wanted to write about all kinds of nice things, but he had to address the false teachers who were worming their way into the church. So today, we are going to look at Revelation. And the way Revelation starts is by addressing the churches. Imagine that, right? So really important. So this is exciting for me as a pastor. This is probably uh, one of the most difficult messages I've ever had to put together. And it's not because uh, Revelation is foreign to me or I don't read it or anything like that. It's how people perceive it. Talked about false teachers, right? There's more false teachings on the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. I mean, it's basically like 99% of them out there are just wrong, right? So it's exciting because it gets to reveal things to you. Revelation, right? So <laughs> I get to reveal some things you might not know. So really exciting. Um, it is indeed the most misunderstood and misinterpreted book of the Bible, and the most mispronounced. It is Revelation, not Revelations. If you made that mistake, don't worry. Just don't make it again. All right, so <laughs> Apocalypse. So it's the Apocalypse of John, and we'll see it really should be the Apocalypse of Jesus. So something that's hidden, Calypso. You ever hear that name, Calypso? It comes from the Greek, hidden. Apocalypse, it's like from the hidden, basically like revealing the hidden, revelation. So that's what it's about. So it's not some kind of secret code book. It's actually revealing things to you. And so the readers of that time would have understood a lot that we kind of make a mystery of, and so we'll get there. But what we're going to do, basically, revelation is part letters, part prophecy. And you could break it into three parts. There are a lot of different ways of interpreting it, and I just don't like the... Uh, just the labels, and I'm this, or I'm that, or I believe it. Stop. They didn't do that in the early church. None of this phraseology existed. None of this theology existed. It just, they would read it for what it was. And so when you're looking at it rightly, you're looking at the first three chapters being letters to the churches, right? So four will open up worship in heaven, that kind of thing. But the middle section, the bulk of Revelation, is prophecy about things that are going to happen in a near-er time, right? So still farther away than then, but near-er time, mostly about Rome. Then you get to the end, and that is about the future time, right? So that's really the way it breaks down, the three parts. But we're going to do two parts. So I want you to see these things as a whole, as a larger picture, and that's the key. And I'm not going to kind of hammer this down because there are a lot of people who aren't new here today, and you've heard this a thousand times. But the way we read the Bible is like reading one line of a book in random order and never finish it. Yet we say we know what it's about, right? So it doesn't work that way. And so you have to look at something like Revelation as a whole. You have to just see it like you're sitting down watching a movie, right? So I'll break this part 
for you, and then we'll get into the prophecy stuff uh, next week. We're going to have to do that next week. Unless you guys want to be here for like four hours, we're good. Right? Anybody? Still not laughing. Okay, tuba players who don't like going to church. Uh, <laughs> so that wasn't funny either. Man. All right. Don't be scared. It's just revelation, all right? It's good. <laughs> all right. So we're going to pay attention to some things. You're going to hear them. This is why I like larger sections of Scripture. It's the way it's supposed to be done. You're going to start to like, oh, okay, see things. Sevens. Sevens are a really big number of completion based on kind of that Sabbath week. So, you know, you're seeing that at the beginning of the Bible, right, the creation account, and you're seeing it at the end of the Bible. Lots of sevens, really important here. Uh, a big theme, suffering and endurance. Look for those words, like suffering and endurance. All right, so, and imagery. I'm going to help you with this, but if you just read Revelation by yourself and you had not both read and understood all of the Old Testament prophets, you're going to be lost. Like, it, it's really going to be hard to understand. So you really have to read the prophets and have an appreciation for that. And, you, and I'll bring up Jesus. You have to kind of especially have read Matthew 24, 25. You have to understand this kind of stuff and, and how it all works. I'll help you with it, but if you're doing your own reading, really important to just like, read the prophets and understand what's going on here. A lot of imagery. Another uh, set of words you're going to look for, like a. It's like this. It's like that. So imagine getting a prophecy, right? So God gives me this prophecy, and all of a sudden I'm looking into heaven, right? This is a copy, right? Just a shadow of the things in heaven. Like, my mind would be blown. I, you know, I don't even know. And so how would I describe it to you guys? I'd be like, well, it's kind of like this, right? Or like that. And so that's why you're going to later, especially, you're going to hear different, like, emerald stones and different stuff like that. Uh, you know, imagine having a prophecy about 2,000 years from now, right? They're going to have modes of transportation and different stuff. So we're going to have to go, it's kind of like an airplane. Or, you know, so there it's like animals. It's, it's like this or it's like that. So pay attention to like a. It is not literal. This is not literal. There's a lot of symbolism in here. I will help you as much as I can with that, and then we can ask more questions at the Bible study. So let's hop right in here, the letters of the churches. So first, Revelation 1.1. This is a revelation from or of, if you're new here, my brackets are usually Greek. When the Greek is a little more literal, literal there, I'll put it in there, of Jesus Christ. So notice, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Not a revelation of John, as it's traditionally titled, which God uh, gave him to show his servants the events that must soon or quickly take place. I think quickly is better, right? Because when is that? I don't know. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listens to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. That's where you're getting scared. All right, so again, revelation of Jesus, right? So it is him being revealed, uncovered. If I didn't say this, you know, right, Calypse, <clears throat> hidden. Calypse is hidden. So this is unhiding something. So that's what Jesus is doing for us here. It's not a mystery. He's just unraveling this for us. So here's the cool thing, right? I guess I'm blessed reads it to so we're supposed so here we, we looked at this in the series right what did they do they would read this to the church that's what we're doing here right and again you're blessed too if you obey right so that's another key here revelation 1 4 this letter is from john to the seven churches in the province of asia asia minor grace and peace to you from the one who is who always was and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit of the seven spirits, so there's seven again, before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to all these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. And amen. So this is a really great opening, isn't it? Because it tells us who Jesus is, what he did for us. It's like a little gospel uh, prayer in there. Grace and peace, right? So if you've been with us for a while, you know the series. We've been going through the books of the Bible. It's kind of the way Paul opens his letters. Grace and peace, setting the tone. Um, and priesthood. Remember First Peter. So we're kind of a priesthood, and he's addressing us, the church. Because remember, the whole context, blessed is the one who listens to this, reads it to the church. So that's you. So then I'll go into another kind of little uh, gospel poem type of thing. Uh, look, he comes on the clouds of heaven. Everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. So once again, what did he do? All the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. And then Jesus comes in. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. 
I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. The Almighty One, refraining what was just said. Yes, you're right, John, like, this is me. Very clear here, Jesus is God. So this is the setup, right? So we're very clear about this, and it's repeated. That's important. All right, so Revelation 1.9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and God's kingdom and the patient endurance to which Jesus called us. Did you catch those words? I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and hair were white like wool. So here we go with the likes. <clears throat> and white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death in the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are happening now happening, and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So a lot to unpack here, but just quickly, a partner in suffering. We've heard that before, like Philippians, right? Your partner is in Jesus' suffering, right? So the Lord's Day, traditionally the first day of the week, Sunday, this is the Lord's Day. He's worshiping, even though he's by himself. Or we don't know, maybe he's exiled on Patmos and he's got friends with him, we don't know. <laughs> Here, but did you catch it? I heard, this is another interesting thing, it'll come up next week. I heard, then I saw. So he'll hear things and then he'll see things. You've got to pay very close attention here. Um, like, uh, of course, uh, son of man. He referred, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, Daniel 7. So this is going right back to what was said. And he comes on the clouds of heaven, right? So that's Daniel 7. He's saying, I'm God. This is the way even the high council understood it. It's one of the things that got Jesus killed. He said this. They know he's saying he's God. So here's an example here where the uh, prophecy is explained to us. A lot of times it's like that. If we just keep reading, it'll kind of just tell you what it is, right? So it'll interpret itself for us. Uh, the sword, I'll talk about the two-edged sword in a minute. So after like the next section or two, I'll, I'll tell you about that too. That's going to be important. So now remember Ephesus, right? So Ephesians, Paul's letter there, and remember Acts 19. Remember the riot in Ephesus. Revelation 2.1, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans or Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So uh, we see this again. False teachers just keeps coming up, right? Again and again, especially as we get closer to the end of the Bible. A lot. All right, so... Again, expose it. You don't tolerate them. And we're not supposed to. Right? In the church, we're not supposed to tolerate that. In fact, we're supposed to expose them. And we see that actually in Ephesians. You see that in Ephesians, right? So don't partner up with the bad deeds. Even expose them. Uh, I'll talk about the Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans just a little bit later. I'll explain them too. Theme, patiently suffering. But here's the problem. I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. So how do we show love? What does he say? Works. 
by doing stuff, right? So what we do says more about what we believe than anything we could possibly say. It's not we're saved by works, right? Ephesians, again, look at that letter, 2.8. We're saved by grace through faith, right? In whom? Jesus Christ. But keep reading. We're created anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good works prepared beforehand for us. So important to understand. So rewards. Now we're going to start getting into rewards. There's going to be, in general, except with one, and there's going to be an issue, like a problem and a reward. A problem and a reward. The reward here, this is a beautiful one, fruit from the tree of life. So now the whole Bible is all coming together because you remember the problem with Adam and Eve, right? What did they eat from the tree like with the, of, of knowledge of good and evil? Right? So they got that knowledge of good and evil, but then God did something really cool because he's like, look, the human beings have become like us. Trinity, right? So knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take from the tree of the fruit of life and eat it? Right? So they'll live forever. So what's the reward? Eternal life, right? So now we get to eat that fruit. Right? So that's the imagery that's going on here. Another thing to look for, I mentioned Trinity really quick. It's just interesting. It, it, this is another reason why you got to kind of read the whole thing. Who, who is giving the prophecy to John? Well, Jesus, right? But wait, what, what does it say to listen to? Listen to the Spirit. And he's talking about the Father. So if you're reading this carefully, you see a picture of the Trinity here. It's really cool. Same voice. So, so one essence, three persons. That's the right way to think of it. Revelation 2.8. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, poverty, excuse me, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they're not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You'll suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. So cl very clear here. Suffering. Are we reading that again? You're going to experience suffering for Jesus. Big theme, though. Remain faithful. This will come up a lot more next week. Remain faithful even when facing death. Right? Then what do you get? Reward? What? Crown of life. Really cool. Also, really importantly, there is no second death. So that's your main reward here. Second death, we're going to read about it. No bueno. Or it's not a good thing. You don't want the second death. So no second death. Continue. Revelation 2.12. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet... You have remained loyal to me. You have refused to deny me, even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans, there they are again among you, who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth." Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So here is that two-edged sword again, and I'll explain that. Uh, so you might have heard this, right? And it's out of context completely. Hebrews 4, like, um, you know, the, the, the word of God is alive and, alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, right? And that's where you stop, right? It divides marrow, right? So, and then it automatically talks about him, him. The word of God is a him there. So it's really interesting. So if they say it's about the Bible, eh, wrong. It's about judgment. And read the next sentence. It says him. So can the word of God be the Bible? Yes, it says it even in here. Absolutely. But it can also be Jesus. And we must know when that is. So Hebrews 4, people don't like it. Context is judgment. That, that double-edged sword, what like someone, a priest preparing a sacrifice would cut with, is very sharp and expose bones and marrow is what it says. Right? It's going to judge you. It's going to cut you open, do a little heart surgery on you. You can't hide. And so nothing can be hidden from him is like the next sentence in Hebrews 4. Nothing can be hidden, right? Nothing creation can be hidden from. So here's what's going to happen. Here's that function of that sword. He's coming to judge. That's the function. So here we see what's going on here. And if you put those two together, you're rightly thinking about what that is. 
Don't deny Jesus. Again, even in suffering comes up. Uh, Nicolaitans explained what's the sexual, what's the sin is the sexual sin. That's the problem here. Idol worship, just to keep things very uh, simple. We saw Balaam before, right? So in Numbers 24, he comes up. Uh, but we saw him. Second Peter, the false teachings, Jude, he comes up. So remember his donkey, donkey talks to him. All right, so what's the reward? Uh, manna in heaven and a new name. Right? He's going to make all things new, and he's going to sustain us in him. Revelation 2.18, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is a message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and eat food, sacrificed to idols, or offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. You see it right there with that double-edged sword. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. I'll ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all those who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So, false teachers... Again, right? What's the big deal? They can lead us astray. It's a very big deal. False teaching is a huge deal. So anyone who's kind of like dismissive of it, no, 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 no. We're not to tolerate that. It can lead you astray in your faith. So not good. And so I've talked about this in the past, but it's true. You know. So why don't you hear about this in the big churches and all the other things? Well, there's kind of an unspoken agreement. Like, I won't call you. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if I'm not calling people out, I'm not doing my job. That's what the Bible says. So you got to deal with it. People are like codependent, right? <laughs> they care what people think of them. If you're going to preach the word, you kind of can't. Like you got to get over that. And that's what we're called to do. So don't tolerate these teachings. So now here's again that function of that sword. Do you see it? They're dividing and judging, knowing what's in you. Uh, reward, really cool one. We'll see it later. Authority over all the nations. So you'll see this like white robes, white stone type of thing. Uh, <laughs> so those who are beheaded in the tribulation, we'll get there, <laughs> we're beheaded. they get to rise up with Jesus first and reign with him a thousand years, having authority over everyone. So getting beheaded in the Bible is kind of a good thing. Nobody's like, yes. Right? Okay. But you know, <laughs> it's supposed to be cool. Anyway, Christ, the morning star. Right? So uh, it, this is really interesting because it actually ties Balaam right in there. Uh, because when he gives, I think it's his fourth prophecy. I'm not going to say oracle or prophecy. When he gives his fourth one, um, he talks about a star will come from Jacob. That's Jesus. So he's prophesying about Jesus. So Jesus is the morning star. And we're going to see this later in Revelation 2. So it's really neat. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to like lay down the Easter eggs for you guys. But it all really does come together when you know the word. Revelation 3.1. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back <clears throat> to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed with white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce them before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So here's the problem. Right? So problem. Again, I know the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. 
Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. And here's the entering. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements. These are two words we don't hear a lot in mainstream evangelical church. <laughs> right? Your actions. They mean something. Wait, God has requirements? Yeah, he created you anew in Christ Jesus, not so that you could do nothing, right? So that you could get out there and be, right, who he wants you to be in Christ. Wake up. So reward. Again, so I told you about being clothed. The beheaded ones are going to get clothed in white. So this is kind of like just looking into that. Uh, you'll see that. Names, so the reward. Names won't be erased from the book of life. We're going to look at the book of life later too. Important, right? So that's we want to be in the book of life. So here's maybe the only church doing well. Revelation 3.7. <laughs> Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. I know the things you do. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they're Jews but they're not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love because you have obeyed my command to persevere. I'll protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crowns. as a crown again. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they'll never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Okay, so they're doing good. Why? Because you obeyed. Is this getting redundant? Right, so it's important. Right, my command to persevere, right? Don't deny me. Obey me. Do not deny me. Again, are we seeing these like, kind of actions, right? So like we looked at this in 1 John, like the, the paradox, right? What you do says more about what you believe than anything you are saying, right? So lots of rewards here. That new name again, pillar in the temple and you won't have to leave it, right? So uh, we looked at this a little bit in 2 Peter. We're going to see in Revelation there's a new heavens and a new earth. Peter says that, uh, and we're going to get to a new Jerusalem too. So that's what this is saying. You're going to be in that holy new city when he kind of just melts the earth away. All right. So the, again, I just want you to understand this too in case you're not picking up this theme. Did you notice something? The rewards, where are they? Not here. They're not here. Right? So heavenly things. All right? Laodicea. Revelation 3.14. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth and vomit you out. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind or naked. Did you catch that? Right? I have everything I need. I'm rich here. Jesus is like, doesn't mean much. So I advise you to buy gold from me. A gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also, buy white garments from me. You see them coming in here again. So that you'll not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together or like a fellowship meal together. Those who are victorious will sit on my throne just as I was victorious and sat, on my um, sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So what's the problem here? Well, this is an interesting one, right? Lukewarm. Indifference complacency. So if you remember the initiation of Jesus' parables, uh, the parable of the sower, you'll remember what is the seed. The seed is the word of God, right? The sower, God's sowing it, right? Someone's sowing the seed. It lands on rocks. What happens? Satan takes it away, right? Lands on rocky-ish soil. What happens? Comes up, gets burned up. What's the implication? I think we know, right? Then some of the seed, the word, lands on like, like these thorn bushes, right? So around like these weeds and thorns. The thorns choke out the word, the word can't produce fruit. And Jesus identifies them as what? The worries about this life and wealth, like things of this world. Uh, so the things of this world can choke out 
the word. They can make you complacent. They can make you indifferent. Like so, that's the warning here. Careful. Purified by fire, refined by trials. There's those white robes again. Did you see that? Correct and discipline. Everyone I love. Hebrews 12 says that God disciplines us, right? Because we're legitimate children. And what kind of father doesn't discipline his child? That's an illegitimate child, is what Hebrews 12 says. You don't want to be an illegitimate child. You get disciplined. He disciplines. So really interesting. There's some language here, and there's the thief in the night thing too. I forgot to mention that. But um, kind of like I told you Matthew 24 and 25, when you get to Matthew 25 at the top there, you read the parable of the, um, the foolish bridesmaids, right? The five forget to bring the oil, and the other five have the oil. So they come back and knock on the door. So what? whoever knocks, right, I will answer the door if you were prepared, like the five wise bridesmaids, right? So what do you get to do? He opens the door and you have a fellowship meal on the throne with Jesus. This is awesome, right? So we're on the throne. We have a fellowship meal. We're invited to this great banquet. So this is where we're going to close with this part of Revelation. This is what the letters to the seven churches are all about. From here, we're going to see next week, we're going to go into the prophecy and visions and stuff like that. Um, and I'm still figuring out how I'm going to condense that <laughs> into one message. So we'll get there, right? So here's the first part. Jesus' response to the churches. So like Philadelphia is doing okay, but aside from that, it's a kind of the same basic idea weaving through here. It begs a question. Is the honeymoon over? Think about it. To Ephesus, why don't you love me as you did at first? So we can see, like, the common denominator here, they all started good. Like, they started with something. And then, like, ah, oh, no. You know, why didn't you love me? For, like, you're, mess you're taking me for granted. You're messing up. So Smyrna, wake up. You were alive, but now you're almost dead. So you see this theme here. So Christian marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. We've seen this in the Bible. We saw it in Ephesians, right? So for husbands, this means love your wives, means love your wives as Christ loved the church. So it says that there in Ephesians 5. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So if we compare this to our relationship with God, uh, but then look at it like as we would a marriage, <clears throat> which the Bible often does, we can put it into some just really tangible and practical light. We can kind of give it a little bit of a near application, something closer to us that we can understand and grab onto. And then look at how this pertains to Jesus. So in a marriage, you know, so Pergamum, what, what's, the, what's the issue there? Well, they're suffering bad times. They're suffering hardships. And this is drawing them away from Jesus. They're like, Ugh, forget this, you know. I don't want to deal with it. Well, so think about it in a marriage. There's, <laughs> there's dating, I'm going to get in so much trouble if I'm not really careful here. And then there's reality, <laughs> right? And there are two different things. Husbands, just be quiet. It's good. You'll laugh later, right? So there are two different things. So, you know, you start dating and you go through the dating phase. And, you know, it, it's like everything's sunshine and rainbows. And did we expect it to be that way all the time? Yeah, right? Well, maybe not you, but I was stupid. And I just, it's all sunshine, right? There's no problems. This is great. And you got the future ahead of you, especially if you're younger, like I was when we were dating. This is awesome, right? It, it, it's just great. And everything's new and everything's wonderful. And so sunshine and rainbows. But then all of a sudden, things happen. <laughs> you start talking about money, right? Maybe you get a house and then you have a mortgage. Who works? Do we both work? Who makes more money? And then all of a sudden, it's not sunshine and rainbows. And then maybe you have a kid. Now, <laughs> that's tough. It's a difficult job. You have a child, it's really tough. That is not, and sorry to my daughter, but you were not always sunshine and rainbows. All right? So, especially in the diaper, that was no, looked nothing like sunshine and rainbows to me. So, <laughs> you know, it's difficult, right? It's, it, so, it's tough. We're suffering through this, right? Then, you know, arguments that you might not have had before. These things cost, you know, cause arguments about the house and this and that. Big things, small things, the cars, blah, 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 it all kind of just piles up and it's not the same. Then, as you get older, what happens? Well, you start breaking down a little, right? That's what the body does. You start having some health issues. And you're like, oh, man. Like, we didn't have that problem. That, like, what's going on here? Some people may be tempted to leave, but here's the thing. You said, in sickness and in health. Thyatira. Isn't there a Jezebel who comes in in that time frame? 
Right? So maybe someone younger. Maybe someone with no health problems yet. Right? Maybe it's new for now. Right? Is that person there? Maybe the grass looks greener. Right? I don't know. Maybe those difficulties won't occur this time. Right. Laodicea, are we coasting or comfortable? Have some of these things caused us to become complacent, right? Like we're in this routine. Maybe we did okay with the house. We got through the arguments. Everything's fine. But you know, it's just, that's it. We're just kind of complacent. And you just go to work. You do your nine to five. Hi, bye, blah, blah, blah. And we just kind of run through the routine. And we're not dating anymore, right? We're not like hanging out. We're not, it's just blah, 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 going through the rhythm. Are we complacent? Are things too convenient? Have we lost our appreciation for the person? Of course, right? They're just there. Of course they're there. We don't need to appreciate them. Have we taken them for granted? Is the relationship shallow? Or has it become shallow? Which makes it very possible for the Jezebel to come into our lives and have an effect on us or our marriage. The church, it's kind of interesting, I'm not going to split hairs here. So the church has been called by some the bride of Christ. If we're being technical, that's not accurate. <laughs> so Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. So if you're being very technical, but still, even if it's called the body of Christ, it is what? The body of Christ, the bride of Christ. It is something that we're supposed to treat like a bride. We're supposed to care for the church, right? So really, really important and very interesting. We've talked about this in the past, so I'll go over it really quick, but it's a good reminder. Matthew 25 again. So what happens, you know, after you get the parables of the, the, the women with the oil, the bridesmaids with the oil, you know, the talents, all that stuff. Well, he goes into the sheep and the goats. And so if you remember what I was saying maybe a few weeks ago, very important, like, you know, hey, you know, the sheep and the goats. So he, the Son of Man's going to come, like the Daniel 7 thing, Jesus on the throne, and he's going to divide, like a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats, the sheep right side, goats on the left. And the sheep, he's going to say like, hey, you know, good job. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was in prison, you visited me. Sick, you visited me, right? They're like, when did we see you like that, Jesus? Ah, well, when you did it to the least of these, and it's an important word, my brethren, you did it to me. Good for you. You're going to inherit the kingdom God's prepared for you. When you did it to who? To my brethren. Who is Jesus' brethren? You. The church. Church isn't a building. It's where we do church, but it's not the church. Church is you. You are the body of Christ, and we're supposed to care for it. Here, Jesus is giving a very stern warning because he goes to the goats. <clears throat> when did we see it? You didn't care for me when I was hungry. You didn't care for me when I was thirsty. You didn't clothe me. You didn't visit me. Nothing. Where do they go? <laughs> to eternal punishment. Gone. Again, do actions mean something? Jesus says they do. But here's the thing. That which you did to my brothers, who's that? You guys, right? the church, we are called to commit to and to care for Christ's body, the church. So if the church is like Christ's bride or body, we begin with a similar type of commitment ceremony. Baptism, that's how it begins. Baptism is supposed to be done through the church. And it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> I changed the way we did it after a while, because I started looking at the Word of God, really, really, like, you know, knowing the Word well. It took me a few years to, like, just read it again and again and again and again, kind of, like, know what's in there. And, and I saw that, like, the church, mainstream church, isn't baptizing people the way they should be baptized in the full context of God's Word. Yes, you can point to, like, the Ethiopian eunuch or something like that. I, I know, I've read it, you know, but still, he was read the Scriptures, and it was explained to him. But if you look at the whole thing, and you see the way Jesus interacted with people. He gives a lot of warnings before people are baptized. It's really important to understand this. A lot of warnings. He's not nice about it either. And I started noticing, like, when I compared, like, what the Word of God says and how Christians are supposed to be prepared and how we're supposed to be in the Word and all this other stuff. And also, traditionally, the way people got baptized in the church, if you go all the way back to early writings and things like that, I would compare the way the church baptizes people today 
like a Vegas wedding. That's the way we do it, right? We might as well do it in a drive-thru, right? <laughs> right? And I've baptized drunk people, too, so it's just like that. <laughs> but no questions, right? No commitment, nothing, right? Like, woo, we're going to get married, right? Honeymoon's never going to be over. Like, this is great. But that's how baptism works, right? You know, you get the T-shirts, let's do it at a water park, never turning back. You know, like, this is awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. But they barely have the gospel articulated to them. It's a Vegas baptism. It doesn't make any sense. Because what does Jesus do? And this is really important to understand. And the why I changed it. I was like, no, 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 no. This is a covenant, right? This is a commitment. This is a marriage to Jesus. And so if you've seen me do a baptism, you see it. It sounds like I'm marrying the person of Jesus. And I kind of am. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I do. I do. I, there's a whole list of things. Traditionally, they're in the church. They're all biblical that you must affirm. And part of it is, are you going to continue with, and they used to say, the apostles' teaching, because it comes from Acts. Look at the four things on the outside of the wall. Are you going to continue in the teaching of the word, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and the prayer? They asked that in the early church. Why? Because it's in the Bible when we see the formation of the church. Those are the four things they're doing, and you should be doing them. And so if you don't go, I will, I'm like, sorry, get out of the pool, right? I'm not going to dunk you. Because you are not going to have a support structure. You're, again, you're like a student who says, I'm not going to school. Well, I'm not giving you a good grade. You know, no. <laughs> I'm a soldier, but I don't want to join an army. You know, great. You know, good luck with that. But it, this is not going to work for you. And there's no warnings. What does Jesus say? Hey, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me, let me bury my dad first. Let the dead bury the dead. Right? Hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. Okay, you're going to be homeless, right? Foxes have the dens. The birds have their nests. But the son of man... No place to rest his head. Cool. Good luck with that. I want to follow you. Anyone who wants to follow me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, then you can follow me. Don't be selfish. Don't consider yourself over anybody else. Right? What do we read? Look out for others' interests, not your own, Philippians. Do that. Don't be so selfish and narcissistic. Pick up your cross, which means you're probably going to have to suffer and die for me. Okay, then you can follow me. Do, do we hear any of that in the baptism? Like, imagine, I always wanted to, like, spoil a baptism by doing it real, right? You know, it's like, visit some other church's baptism, run in, hop in the pool at the water park, right? Like, and jump in and just be like, go on, can I do this one? <laughs> right? Okay, so listen, Jesus says you're, you might get crucified for this. You good with that? What? This doesn't sound anything like they because they didn't warn you. Oh, you see what I mean? There are way too many Vegas baptisms. Here's the thing. Jesus wants you to understand that you made a very serious commitment. There's no bait and switch here. Like, here it is. This is what's good. It's like getting married without marriage counseling. You know what I mean? Like, we go through this. When I'm doing marriage counseling with people, I'm like, okay, this is what's going to happen. You know, this is what you're going to hit. How are you going to deal with it? None of that. So what's going to happen? I see it all the time. We saw people just falling away like crazy. This doesn't work. We have to honor that. So if we're honoring that, Ephesus, it starts with a question. Why don't you love me as you did at first? And what happened? Wake up. Return to me. If the commitment isn't serious, though, what might you say? Return to what? Pergamum, suffering in bad times. Again, like a marriage. Did we think it would be all sunshine and rainbows? Jesus warned us against that. Again and again. Are we reading Revelation? You just, there you go. You read three chapters of the Bible. What does he say a lot? You're suffering. What does he say? Hey, you know what? It's all good. Like, you shouldn't be. I'll talk to the devil about that. We'll try to just stop that suffering. No. It's to test and refine you. That's what he says. His workout's going to be hard. When you come out on the other end, you'll get the reward. That's what he says. Right? So think about it. Again, in baptism, you should be asked the sickness and in health question. If we're taking this seriously like a marriage, like you're going to stay with Jesus in sickness and in health? Right? You're going to deny him? I don't know. Or were we lied to? By false teachers. This is why the false teachers are so bad. Right? You're not given any of these warnings. And so, of course, right, you're going to get baptized. Everything's going to be great. And then the next day, what? You know, like somebody dies, right? You get in a car accident. Something bad happens. And you're like, 
This didn't work. But you you weren't warned. Like if they did it like Jesus did it, you would have gone, oh, yeah, you know, said that's going to happen. But it's cool. I got Jesus. Right attitude. Thyatira. Is there a Jezebel in our faith lives, right? So this is, these false teachers, they're like Jezebel interrupting your faith life. You know how many times, like, there's so many bad teachers. We did the deliverance ministry thing. And I just had someone come back to me and be like, thank you for, like, liberating me from that. False teachings can lead you astray. They can hold you under the, this yoke. It's terrible what they can do to you. It's the half gospel. Yes, we're going to be blessed, especially if we listen and obey. <laughs> God blesses us here in this world right? so that we can be a blessing. That's, that's the point. But the other half of it is this, if not more, if I'm being honest with you. I'm reading you the word of God. Did, what were the blessings like in the future? We're not supposed to fix our eyes on things here. That's how you fall away. But if you've been told, right, that's what this is all about, it's all going to be good, you can do whatever you want, whatever it is, you're going to fall away. And that's why it's so bad. We can't be short-sighted. Laodicea, are we in a shallow relationship with Jesus as a result? A lot of these false teachings do that. Satan loves it because they keep you in this very shallow relationship with Jesus where it's just about stuff. Just about the urgency of the immediate and meeting that need. Shallow. Let's think about it, right? If we're being short-sighted, what are we? Shallow. We're not deep. Well, who wants to go deep? That's difficult, right? Got to learn how to tread water and swim and stuff. Nope, I just want to stay in the kiddie pool. And that's where most Christians are, in the kiddie pool. Shallow. But what does Jesus want? Hot or cold, right? I want a deep relationship with you. I don't want this lukewarm stuff, complacency. You see, faith commitment, it's a long game. It's not a short-sighted game. It's a long game, just like marriage is, right? So some keys to keeping the love alive, right? So just think about this. First and foremost, remember why you got in the relationship in the first place. Whether that's a marriage, speaking to married people, it helps, Right? Why did you fall in love with this person? In the first? One of those beautiful things. I'm going to try not to cry because it was just so beautiful. I remember this like years ago. I, I had to be, oh gosh, 20 years ago. I don't know what it was, whatever, like 15, 20 years ago. Just coming to my mind. God just bring it to my mind. There was an older couple sitting at this really nice restaurant we were going to. And they're like 70-something years old, just you know, much older than us. And the man said, like, when I look in your eyes, I see the same person. It was beautiful. I was like, I want to be like that. Not old, but <laughs> I ruin good moments, if you know me. That's what How beautiful. Like, like, and it is. It's, it, it's true. I still look in my wife's eyes. I'm like, man, I see that kid that I, that, that I fell in love with years ago. Like, remembering that. Like, but, you know, okay, so, so you love Jesus. Now, this is the bad thing about false teachers. Why? Because they present the wrong Jesus to us. We don't know Jesus, and we fell in love with, like, a different counterfeit Jesus. you got to fall in love with the Jesus that disciplines us, right? The Jesus that gives us warning. He's kind of snarky sometimes. Like, it's just, that's the way God is, and that's okay, right? But remember, why did you fall in love with him? Well, there are a lot of reasons, right? So why did you choose to make this promise to this person? Well... The one who sacrificed himself for us. And that's really an interesting thing. We must remember that commitment. And so think about it. Like this world today, commitment's like a bad, I'm saying a bad word, right? It's like saying repent, right? It's like commit. Like, I don't want to do that. I have so many choices, you know, I don't want to commit to anything. It's like a bad word. But remember when that was like a good thing? You know, remember when you could like shake hands with somebody, look in their eyes, and then you know that that's going to happen. They commit to things, like they do things, or they finish projects and stuff. You know, now it's like, oh, squirrel, you know, and it's it just like, cause why, TikTok, whatever it is, like, t -t 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 everything's fast, ah, it's, it takes too long, it takes too long, can't do that. We're short-sighted, like literally and figuratively, it's just unbelievable. The world, <laughs> it's full of lies, broken promises, but the word is not. Right? And it talks about things like, bless you, things like commitment, right? Being really committed to things. That's a good quality, especially to people, especially to Jesus. Another key 
It said sacrifice, and it's remembering that sacrifice. So, like, let's just zoom it in and bring it to, like, tangible things. And I think about my relationship with my wife, and I just think about how we got together. We were very, very young. We were both, you know, like, out of our homes at a very young age, and so, you know, we had to work really hard to get, like, our first apartment, <laughs> which was crazy, R really bad place, you know, but uh, got our first apartment. But we worked. Like, I think she worked three jobs and went to college. I can hear people complain, like, okay, I'm going to go to work because I go to school. No, it was unbelievable. Like, I don't know when we slept. I have no idea. I was starting my business. I talked about author before. I was like writing my first books. Like I can just remember like, you know, <laughs> working all day, you know, and then go in there she is. Hi. And I would fall asleep at like my computer, like writing my book. <sighs> I'd wake up and there's the book again. Oh, go again. You know, just that's it. Maybe you slept four hours, six hours. But here's the thing, especially as we got older, like we did that for each other. Right? We sacrificed things. Like, so it was time for her to go get her master's degree, and she had to travel a long way. And, you know, so, okay, oh, I'm going to watch, you know, the baby. I'm going to do that. And then she's going to get a job that has health insurance. Like, just, you know, practical things. We didn't have a lot. And so, okay, you get the insurance. I watch the kid. Listen, guys, we don't want to watch the kid, right? <laughs> but you do it. You do it. You know, and then I remember everything she did. Did she really want to commute, you know, two hours to go get her master's degree to college at that age and work full time and watch the baby when I was like, you know, if she came home, if I'm like, cheers, you know, so like, you know, she did that too, probably way more than me. So I remember that, right? Think about having a child. I can't imagine that happening to my body, right? You know, so, you know, it's the nine months, it's terrible, you know, they gain all this weight, and it just, and that's got to hurt, you know, it's like, I remember, remember one word, if you, if you, epidural, <laughs> epidural, right? So that was very important. Anyway, and if, if you've had a kid, you know about that. If you went through it without it, you're crazy, because I don't understand, <laughs> like, it was like the craziest thing, but I remember, right, I think about that, like, I'm not sure if I would have had a kid for you. Like, I don't think so. Like, I don't know. No, no, and I'm not trying again. No, it's a girl. That's what you get. We're done, right? You know, so maybe she did do that. But anyway, but that's sacrifice, man. That's crazy. And so remember that. Remember that. Jezebel hasn't done any of that for you, nor is she proven, nor does she, you know that she will. Will she stick it out and sickness? I've been sick. I'm a baby when I get sick because I don't get sick a lot. So when I get sick, it's like I'm dying, right? So, but I remember she took care of me when I, when I was a real pain in the neck. I said a different body part than what she said maybe, <laughs> right? But she dealt with me. There are things. I'm not going to talk about her things because, you know, whatever. But just me, like, I'm not easy. I remember that. I'm like, oh, that's sacrifice. Now let's look at Jesus. All of those things pale in comparison to what he's done for us. Is there anyone better to be in love with? Nope. And this is the way a good marriage is. I love Jesus more than I will ever love her. That's what allows me to really love her. That's the key. Because, wow, God, God, did not regard equality, right, with God. It's something to be taken advantage of. Jesus came and he humbled himself. He died for us. He carried our sins and died the death that we deserve. I don't think that there's any such thing as a good person. None of us are. Don't be under that illusion or let anyone tell you otherwise. There's no such thing as a good person except Jesus. That's it. Right? He paid the price. He did what we deserve, died an excruciating death on a cross. And if we're being honest, would we? Well, we'll look at that question next week, but wow. Remembering that sacrifice. So we make a commitment to him as he's committed to us. That's how it is in relationship. It begins with our personal relationship with him. So like our marriage or whatever, that's a picture of that relationship. But it begins there in that committed, faithful, loving relationship with our Lord. That's everything. And it extends to his body, the church. Again, what I said, it's the context for most of the New Testament. It's important. And so that's why we devote our things. You can look at the outside walls, right? Acts 2, right? 242. So devoted to God's word. Clearly, we're devoted to God's word. I'm doing my best, right? To each other, 
the fellowship, the breaking the bread. You'll be told about that after the service. Breaking the bread, the prayers, important. Right? We listen to God. We listen to God. And so those are some practical things we can do to keep the relationship with Jesus working, both the personal, right, the practical, and here, both the spiritual and the practical, where they come together and they meet in church. That'll help us through the good times, the bad times, the sickness, the health. We're here for each other as Christ's body. And in doing so, we must keep our eyes on the long-term commitment. Right, so it's all over the Bible, but Colossians 3 comes to mind, right? We, we focus on heavenly things, not earthly things. Right, Hebrews 12, we can, go, we can go back there, right? So how do we do this, right? We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and champion of our faith. Paul said it in Philippians 3, beautiful. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize, right? So for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. So we saw the prizes today. That's the encouragement I want to leave you with today. Just beautiful things. Fruit from the tree of life. We have eternal life if we endure in Jesus, if we stay faithful to him. No second death. You know, people are like, oh, we shouldn't be preaching on fire and brimstone. I don't know. The Bible does. <laughs> are we suggesting that we leave something out? But we don't have to fear that if we're in Jesus. It's beautiful. A new name. Making all things new. It doesn't matter what's happening here, the scars you're wearing. It's all going to be gone. And we'll read it. No more tears. No crying. No pain. No suffering. Just joy in Jesus. That's it. Beautiful. Authority over the nations. The justice you're looking for here, don't worry about it. It'll be taken care of. It'll be a just and righteous place that we go to without any of these problems. They won't exist. We'll be clothed in white. No matter what we suffer or what we have to go through, or the price that we pay for following Jesus. We'll enter in and we'll be a part of that fellowship meal with Jesus, the great feast, and we'll be with him on the throne of God. What could be better? Priceless. Priceless. And so this morning, I want to pray for you and just leave you with that encouragement. Lord, I thank you for this time, for this church, for everyone who came in to hear your word and honor your word. And I just, I just thank you uh, for just giving me the opportunity, uh, the honor and the privilege of overseeing a, a faithful flock of those who have devoted themselves to you, Jesus, to your word, that come here for the truth. And I just pray, I pray that they can just be vehicles of your grace, your mercy, your love, letting that light shine to the city around us, all that we encounter, all that we encounter so that we can let more people know about you and the prizes that await us in your heavenly kingdom. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.